Things have definitely been interesting in the crypto world in the past few weeks. Crypto investors, be warned. Be prepared for a volatile holiday weekend. A tweet from the chief investment officer of Guggenheim Partners, a global asset management group controlling $270 billion worth of assets. A public service announcement? Or more coordinated market manipulation from institutional whales? How about Wall Street be warned? Be prepared for a volatile decade of disruption. Hello, I'm Crypto Casey, and welcome to another episode of Last Week Crypto. Every Sunday, we review the performance of the largest cryptocurrencies, top gainers, as well as the latest global news stories affecting the crypto markets this past week. This week, we will discuss what's going on with the traditional world of finance with repo markets, reverse repo markets, the Fed's continued display of ignorance, and how I think this will affect the crypto markets in the future. To check out the links to all of the articles we discuss, go to CryptoKC.com forward slash last week crypto. This week's episode is brought to you by Crypto.com, an exchange with over 100 different cryptocurrencies and over 20 different fiat currencies. On Crypto.com's mobile app, you can buy crypto with bank transfers, credit, debit cards, or crypto at true cost with no markups. They also have a desktop exchange that is solely for crypto to crypto trading. If you use the link below to sign up for Crypto.com, you'll receive $25 worth of cryptocurrency for free when you use the referral code CryptoKC, all while supporting the channel. Also, every Wednesday, I conduct a weekly AMA or Ask Me Anything at Instagram.com forward slash CryptoKC. So use the link to my one and only official Instagram account listed in the description area to follow me and ask me anything you want every Wednesday, except for this past Wednesday. Definitely dropped the ball on that one and did a belated AMA. And hey, a belated AMA is better than no AMA. If you'd like to see me live stream with some other crypto experts in the space, I've started live streaming on the Crypto Banter YouTube channel. Most Fridays at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard, I plan on bantering with the crew about crypto and will also co-host some of the weekday shows as well. So make sure to follow me on Instagram to get notified when I'm going live. And you can also subscribe to the Crypto Banter YouTube channel for notifications as well. Awesome. Let's dive into Last Week Crypto. Looking at the top cryptocurrencies by market cap, Bitcoin down 8.8%, ETH down 4.5%, Binance Coin down 4% and Cardano down 11.2%. Looking at the top gainers this week, Helium up 22.3%, Theta Fuel up 17.7%, Polygon holding it together fairly well through the tumultuous times up 10.8% and Celsius up 9.8%. Nice. The crypto markets are insane. That's really not out of the ordinary. There are a lot of content creators in the crypto space that focus mostly on hour to hour, day to day, week to week price action what to buy, when to buy it, comparing charts from this market cycle to previous market cycles, trying to time the market, predict the bear and the bull trends. And hey, I feature some of that content as well. However, the coordinated market manipulation of the market that caused an extreme pullback the other week, and considering all of these other factors like COVID, massive stimulus, inflation, supply chain breakdowns, the superheated housing market, among other things we will discuss in this video, considering all of these things, it becomes quite clear that referencing historical charts, trends, and how traditional financial activity usually plays out with financially savvy players, whatever crypto's fate price-wise is in the near or distant future, I have a prediction, I'm just not certain on the timeline, as it would be all predicated on the continued political and institutional manipulation of essentially the whole world at this point. So in this episode, we are going to discuss some interesting things afoot that may affect the bedrock of the entire global financial system, and that would undoubtedly shake things up in crypto as well. We will look at how domestic and global financial entities like banks, hedge funds, and other financial institutions have been playing the pandemic-stricken, politically manipulated market and what may be on the horizon if we start experiencing an economic collapse. So this is a semi-long explanation of what we should be aware of from the foundational financial system that affects the entire global financial system. So bear with me here. The Fed controls the US money supply in two ways. One, printing money, and two, issuing, buying, and selling treasury bonds. And a bond is just a fancy word for a loan. So bonds are loans or debt instruments. And treasury bonds refers to debt issued by the US government. So how does the Fed's issuance, buying and selling of treasury bonds affect the money supply? Well, the entities that buy treasury bonds from the Fed, the dollars they use to buy the bonds are taken out of circulation and locked up with the Fed, which decreases the overall money supply in circulation. 
And when the Fed buys back treasury bonds, the dollars they pay to the entities that they're buying from is then put back into circulation, therefore increasing the money supply. And treasury bonds are assets similar to blue chip stocks like Apple that pay their stockholders dividends over time. Except by holding treasury bonds, the holder receives set interest payments over time. So when people or entities feel uncertain about markets and the economy at large, they typically choose to buy and hold treasury bonds because they are less risky than other assets. Nice. Next, let's talk about what the repo market is and how it works. The word repo is short for repurchase agreements. And the repo market is where the other entities that make up our traditional financial economy, besides the Fed, like banks, hedge funds, and financial institutions like insurance companies, pension funds, etc. This is where they can lend assets like treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, or other types of assets to each other in exchange for cash for a fixed amount of time at a certain interest rate. And the interest rate is simply the cost to borrow the money. While the fixed amount of time or term of the loans can range from overnight, two weeks, one month, or whatever they decide, but it's usually a short-term loan. So out of all of the types of assets used as collateral in the repo market, the safest and preferred asset is, of course, treasuries. When hedge funds, financial institutions, or banks need cash for liquidity, they can swap treasuries they have for cash from banks in the repo market. And when the term of the loan expires, the financial institution pays the cash they borrowed back to the bank with interest. The interest rate charged is usually dictated by how much money is in circulation. The more money in circulation, the lower the interest rate and vice versa. So the supply versus demand of cash sets the interest rates. However, there are other factors that can cause interest rates to increase and decrease. For example, if there's more demand for cash than the circulating supply of cash, interest rates can get too high. When this happens, the Fed usually steps in and buys treasuries from banks in exchange for cash to put more cash into the ecosystem to lower the interest rates. Another factor that can cause interest rates to borrow cash to increase is if hedge funds or financial institutions are not financially stable or possibly close to insolvency and therefore are a much riskier borrower. So if there are a lot of high risk entities that need cash in the repo market, they're willing to pay a higher interest rate for the cash, which naturally causes interest rates to go up. And yet another factor that can increase interest rates is if there isn't enough preferred collateral like treasuries available in the market. So if an entity that needed cash was a high risk borrower with no preferred collateral like treasuries to secure the loan, banks can refuse to lend them money. This high demand for cash and low supply of preferred collateral also drives up the cost to borrow money. And when the supply of treasuries in the market is low, institutions will engage in what's known as rehypothecation. Rehypothecation is just a fancy word that basically means an entity letting another entity get a loan using their collateral. For example, let's say a hedge fund needs cash, but doesn't have any treasuries to secure a loan themselves. The hedge fund can call in a favor from one of their financial institution buddies that has treasuries and essentially borrow it from them to use as collateral for the loan. When financial institutions let other people borrow their treasuries, the treasuries are deemed rehypothecated. And as you can imagine, rehypothecated treasuries aren't exactly a safe form of collateral because at the end of the day, the banks lending the money don't know who actually owns the treasury. And they also don't know how many times the treasury has been rehypothecated. Because yes, the same treasury can be rehypothecated multiple times allowing multiple entities to essentially reuse the same exact treasury as collateral. Awesome. Now that we have a good summary of how the Fed controls the money supply by counterfeiting, <clears throat> I mean, creating money and treasury bonds for financial institutions to use to manipulate the markets, or rather do big, important financial stuff lay people like us couldn't possibly understand or wrap our heads around. Let's talk about how and why interest rates in the repo market have gone negative and what that may mean about the current state of the global financial system. So interest rates in the repo market have gone negative because there's been both an increase in demand for collateral versus cash and a supply shortage of preferred collateral, that being treasury bonds, in the repo market. Since the Fed has been both printing new dollars into the ecosystem and buying up all the treasury bonds from the repo market in exchange for cash, this further increases the amount of dollars in the ecosystems. So banks and other financial institutions are literally bursting at the seams with excess cash they don't want. As a result, 
all these entities with excess cash are now saying to other entities, hey, we will pay you interest to borrow our cash in exchange for your treasury bonds. So instead of the borrower having to pay the lender interest on the cash loan, the lender is literally paying the borrower to take their money. This is because the cash lender wants to pay the cash borrower interest to borrow their collateral. Strange, right? So all the financial institutions would rather pay to borrow treasury securities than hold cash. They want the collateral, not the cash. Now, why is it so? Well, why do financial entities do anything ever? In order to make a profit. In this particular situation, the financial institutions were looking to short treasuries. And the most clever way for entities to short treasuries was by borrowing other entities' treasuries to sell on the treasury market with the same intention of buying those same treasuries back at a later date at a cheaper price. In this scenario, the entity profits from the difference of the interest they paid to the original holder of the treasury and the cheaper price they bought the treasury back for from the market. Wow, that doesn't sound sketchy at all, right? Borrowing a security you don't own to sell in the treasury market, to wait for the price to decline, then buy it back to profit from the short, only at the wonderful racket that is the repo market. So basically a bank can go to a financial entity and say, hey, you want some money? Because I want your treasury. And since there's so much money circulating right now in the US, they're like, nah, we're good, good on the cash front from the stimmy checks and PPP, brah. Then the banks are like, look guys, we will pay you to take our money if you just give us your treasuries. Hence the negative interest rate. So then the entity is like, dang, you're gonna pay us to take your money? Sign me up. The reason the bank wants treasuries is because they are taking a short position on the treasury bonds under the belief that the inflation is increasing. Therefore, the interest rates on treasuries are increasing and in turn causing the price of treasuries to decrease. So what does that mean for the domestic and global financial systems? Is this an indication that a global financial crisis or economic collapse is imminent? Well, if this completely asinine process couldn't get any weirder, Leave it to the Fed to take it to the next level by doing what they do best, or rather what they try and fail miserably at, which is manipulating the price of money by trying to keep interest rates down while creating a massive treasury and cash supply imbalance. Lovely. What the Fed could have done is issued more treasuries into the market, which would have led to financial entities buying treasuries from the Fed in exchange for cash. And when this happens, all the cash paid to the Fed is actually locked up in the Fed's account, therefore decreasing the supply of money in circulation. But instead of locking up more money and getting it off the streets, the Fed has been locking up treasuries and depriving the market of the collateral it needs to operate in order to increase the already excess supply of money. Look, I know this stuff is boring and hard to follow, but stick with me here. If financial entities are paying other entities to take their money so they can borrow treasuries to sell on the market and buy back for a lower price in the future, However, the Fed continues to buy treasuries, locking them up and making a massive supply shortage of treasuries. What is that going to do to the value of those treasuries? Well, if the demand is high for treasuries and the supply is dwindling, those treasuries the banks were banking on decreasing in value are actually becoming more valuable due to the supply shortage and high demand imbalance. Nice. So then what happens? Well, the banks shorting treasuries would be forced to start buying them back as quickly as possible at any price because they would start to lose money extremely quickly. Sound familiar? Of course, this is exactly what happened with the GameStop fiasco, a short squeeze. And if you'd like to learn more about how the GameStop short squeeze happened, you can check out my video explaining what went down by clicking on the link above. So if banks start scrambling to buy up all the treasuries from the treasury market, what happens to the repo market? Well, it basically has what caused this whole issue in the first place, a shortage of sufficient collateral. Then what happens is more of the same we discussed earlier, more rehypothecation, where entities start borrowing each other's collateral in order to stay liquid. And if five or 10 or 20 entities are using the same exact treasuries as collateral to stay liquid, what happens if one of them goes insolvent? Yeah, basically a game of musical chairs with like one chair per 20 people trying to sit in it when the music stops. And that's just assuming banks with cash would be willing to lend to all these entities using treasuries that have been lent out to God knows how many others. If the banks consider the trade too risky, they would just choose not to lend to them, which would create a global liquidity problem from the shortage of dollars, causing the price of the dollar to skyrocket. 
all on top of an already unstable financial system. Scary stuff. Well, we've got some stories fresh off the press that may have pivoted us off of a more short-term collision course, but probably not. Let's check it out. This week, the Fed drained $485 billion in liquidity from the market via reverse repos, undoing four months of quantitative easing, even as quantitative easing continues in total assets near $8 trillion. It's a crazy situation the Fed backed into as a tsunami of liquidity goes haywire, the banking system strains under $4 trillion in reserves, and the general treasury account gets drawn down. So we discussed repos in the repo market, but what are reverse repos? Well, the Fed's reverse repo market lets eligible firms like banks and money market mutual funds park large amounts of cash overnight at the Fed at a time when short-term funding rates have fallen to next to nothing and finding a home for cash has become harder. So basically, financial entities are allowed to offload cash to the Fed in exchange for treasuries for a short period of time. And this is done to ease the burden of having to hold onto the cash financial entities can't really put anywhere else. Holding cash requires entities to have a certain amount of collateral backing it. And with a collateral shortage, the temporary breather the reverse repo program gives them has become extremely popular again. Let's review further. Why demand for Fed's reverse repo facility is surging again? Either there is too much cash or not enough collateral, said Scott Scrim, Executive Vice President in Fixed Income and Repo at Curvature Securities. Scrim views high demand lately for the Fed's reverse repo facility as a sign that the central bank's roughly year-old $120 billion a month bond buying program no longer works as intended by adding liquidity to financial markets and should be scaled back. Right now, the more money you put in, you get it right back, he said. The market is saying it's time. There is the evidence that QE has gone too far. The thing is, the liquidity is being placed here as there is nowhere else for it to go. Garvey wrote of the Fed's reverse repo program, and it's not really where you want to park cash, given that the rate paid to the cash lender is 0%. Declining treasury bill supply since February has contributed to the imbalance, with more market rates threatening to go negative, either explicitly or through deposit fees, pouring money into the reverse repo program facility at a zero rate is the least painful alternative, said Lou Crandall, chief economist at Wrightson ICAP. The Fed could stop buying securities altogether and reduce its balance sheet, which would also drain liquidity from the market. But the Fed cannot do that because it said it would be slow and deliberate in announcing changes in its monetary policy that it might eventually talk about talking about tapering, so it can't just suddenly do an about face. But this liquidity haywire situation appears to be an emergency that needs to be addressed now. And so the Fed is addressing it through the back door via the overnight reverse repos. A BTIG research team led by Julian Emanuel described the situation like a game of cat and mouse. High demand for the Fed facility underscores pressures on the short end of the yield curve as near-term rates probe negative territory after a year plus of extraordinary accommodative policy, the team wrote in a Sunday note. But they also expect the issue to last until investors are confident enough to shift to longer duration bonds, which isn't expected to happen until markets get more clarity on the Fed's plan to taper its bond purchases. Yes, a flurry of disturbing information for sure. I'll let the savage Finn Henrik summarize it nicely for us. Our nearly half a trillion in daily reverse repos signs of smooth market functioning or just a hint of a financial system grossly bloated with excess liquidity because a certain central bank doesn't have the moral courage to say enough is enough. But are we even surprised? I mean, we are talking about the most undemocratic institution in the country unelected by the people with absolute power and no checks and balances, and congressional oversight only on paper and not in practice, unchallenged by the media, hiding under the mantle of independence, a monetary North Korea. Awesome. So what does this mean for crypto? I'll keep my prediction short and sweet. If or when we have a global financial crisis, the crypto market will fall, as well as the stock market. Significantly? Probably. When? I don't know. But once it happens, the only place for investor money to go, in my opinion, will be crypto. I mean, what else are you going to buy? More overvalued stocks? Certificates of gold that have likely been rehypothecated over and over again? We know most gold investments are under collateralized. If everyone demanded their physical gold, there's not enough to go around. So, what else? Overpriced houses? 
Rental properties that the government at any time could suspend rent payments towards. Guns, bullets. Here's the deal, everyone should do their own research. The way I see it though, a lot of financially savvy money has been quietly pouring into crypto. Because they're speculative investors? Or do they see the writing on the wall? Bitcoin was born out of the 2008 financial crisis in order to withstand financial crises. And it still hasn't even gotten its chance to prove itself. So if and when a crisis occurs, I think we would see a significant dump in crypto, followed by an explosion in value, and sustained growth over time for decades to come. The timing of it all? I don't really feel comfortable calling it because, as I said at the beginning of this video, it's going to be largely predicated on the continued political and institutional manipulation of essentially the whole world at large at this point. Either way, as the value of crypto increases or decreases in these crazy times, make sure you are transferring your crypto off of exchanges to hold safely in a cold storage hardware wallet. You can scroll down to the description area below to access the correct and official sites of my recommended hardware wallets. BC Vault is my personal favorite. Another option is the Ledger Nano Backup Pack, so scroll down to check them out. Or if you would rather make income from your idle digital assets you're planning to hold for the long term, you can safely earn interest with services provided by BlockFi. With a BlockFi interest account, your cryptocurrency can earn up to an 8.6% APY. Interest accrues daily and is paid monthly. There are no hidden fees and no minimum balances. So if you're interested in learning more about BlockFi, you can get up to a $250 Bitcoin bonus when you use the link below in the description area to sign up, all while supporting the channel. Protecting your ability to generate income so you can buy more crypto is another important thing to consider. So if you'd like to learn more about the advanced technical concepts of blockchain and become a developer in this space, check out I'm in Ontech's Academy. If you use the link below, you can access the Academy at a discounted price. So scroll down to check it out. Awesome. Well, that was Lastly Crypto with me, Crypto Casey. If you enjoyed the episode, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for more crypto content. To check out the links to all the articles we discussed, go to CryptoCasey.com forward slash last week crypto. So what do you think about this whole reverse repo situation? Are we getting closer to an actual economic collapse? Or do you think the global financial system will balance itself out? Let me know in the comments below. Be safe out there.